So Oz, tell us about your earliest memories of being in China. Well, I was born in North China during World War II. So my memories of that are extremely hazy. And much of it comes from my parents' stories, which I heard afterwards. Um, I had two brothers, the three of us. My grandfather had founded the hospital and my mother, who was a surgeon, was one of the doctors there. And we were caught in a terrible famine. So we had the Japanese army on one side who had killed 17 million in their invasion. And then we had the communist army north of us and the nationalist army on the other side. And then there was a famine, locusts. Chiang Kai-shek could have sent food, but he didn't because he wanted it for his own troops. And in three months, five million died, including my two brothers. And when I nearly died, my mother nearly died. When we joined the refugees on the road looking for food and so on, there were 10 million on the road. And there was cannibalism, people selling their children for an evening meal, you know, all sorts of horrendous things. So it was the end of that were my first memories of life. Wow. Why were your parents there? Your, your mum was working as a surgeon. They went as medical missionaries? Yes, my great-grandfather was a friend of Hudson Taylor's and his oldest daughter married Hudson Taylor's son. So Mrs. Howard Taylor, who wrote all the books, her maiden name is Geraldine Guinness. My grandfather, her younger brother, went at the end of the 19th century, so he survived the Boxer Riots, and incredible stories connected with that. And then my parents were both born in China, and after education back in Britain, they went out. And as I said, my mother, she was the surgeon and running the hospital. So your mother was working as a surgeon, but obviously your family was there as missionaries to bring the message of Jesus. Oh, absolutely. My dad, in his 90th year, long after they'd left China, went back. He met people he'd led to Christ 50 years earlier. And of course, the explosion of the church was extraordinary. So when my parents left in the mid 50s, and they were some of the last six Westerners there, there were probably three quarters of one million. Wow. And now only the Lord knows, 80 to 100, maybe more than that, million Christians in China. I remember reading a story where you were sent off to boarding school as a very young child, I guess, and your dad left something to remind you. What was that? Well, we moved from Kaifeng, which I just described, down to Nanjing, which had just suffered the terrible rape of Nanking. And uh, there were no local schools, so I had to go by plane to Shanghai to school. And uh, first time away from my home, my parents gave me, my father gave me, he was an artist, two little smooth stones one of them had his life motto, found faithful, and the other had my mother's life motto, please him. And I had one in each of the pockets of my shorts. Was that, was that something that was um, like deeply encouraging and moving? Yeah, you sort of, I was homesick for one thing, but you know, trying to live the family way and you feel it in your pocket and there it was. What was the legacy of Hudson Taylor at that time in China for you, your family? Well, you know, there are missionaries and missionaries, and many missionaries have been accused of colonialism and all that sort of stuff. But Hudson Taylor, with his idea of the China inland mission, now they didn't sit in the treaty ports like Shanghai. They went inland and they learned the local dialects and they wore Chinese clothes and they became Chinese to reach the Chinese. That was the tradition in which my parents and grandparents went out and I'm very grateful. They really served the Chinese and left a tremendous heritage in terms of medicine, the hospital my grandfather founded is now a huge uh, military medical hospital. But you can see how many of the top colleges in China were founded by Christian missionaries. What Hudson Taylor did at the time was actually quite different because there were other missionaries in China at the time. Um, why do you think his approach was so different? Well, I think he modeled it on the incarnation. To reach us as human beings, our Lord becomes one of us. 
And obviously that's the pattern. Paul, all things to all people, a Jew to the Jews, Gentile to the Gentiles, Chinese to the Chinese. You know, it's very natural for evangelicals to model themselves on Jesus and on Paul's principles and really contextualize the gospel and make it one with whatever the culture is. Your family was one of the last to leave China. What do you think for you, your family and the mission, missionary leaders at the time thought was going to happen? They didn't know. But I remember when they came out, they went round on what was then called deputation. They'd go to meetings and people would come up to my dad because I was with him. And they'd say, oh, Henry, so sad that your work has been wasted. And he'd say, no, no, we planted the seed. God is sovereign, we'll see what happens. But as I said, when he went back in his 90th year, this is 50 years later, where we lived in North Central China, Henan, is the epicenter of the fastest growth of the church, the whole church, in 2,000 years. And my dad came back, you know the Latin version of Simeon's prayer, Nunc Dimittis, Lord let your servant depart in peace. My dad was like that, he was just so happy. My mother had already gone to heaven, he was just ready to go. The fruit of what they'd done 50 years earlier was quite phenomenal. It's, it's hard to kind of, it's, it's hard to get a concept of what it must have been like for your dad to walk around and see that fruit. That's right, where we lived at the end, I mean Nanking is printing and distributing more Bibles, I think, than anywhere else in the world. So again, they were incredibly encouraged. And where I go back to China every two or three years now, and it's always encouraging to meet people who know how much they owe to the sacrifice of missionaries earlier. So what do you put that growth under persecution down to? Truly to the Holy Spirit, but also the incredible courage of people under persecution. Now I remember as a small boy when I was six or seven, you know, the sermon started to get interminably long. And I said to my dad, you know, what's happening? This is really boring. He said, well, listen, they know persecution's coming. So they're laying down all the teaching and the depth and the fellowship that they can possibly have. So they're ready when it comes. Wow. When you go back now, what do you see in the church in China? Well, I've mainly been back to universities and those sort of circles or several times to the Chinese Academy of the Social Sciences. So I've seen China at a very different level. I had lunch with the son of Mao Zedong's keeper of the antiquities and things like this. I remember one time at one of the Chinese Academy, the question of the day, this is 10 years ago, it'd be different today. Which faith would replace Marxism in China? In other words, as they put it quite candidly, the party is in power, the ideology is hollow, and the word vacuum was repeated all day. And they, they ran through the options. Would it be nationalism? Would it be materialism? Would it be Confucianism? Would it be Buddhism? And they went through the pros and cons of each. And the last one was, in 20 years time, it's conceivable, would it be the Christian faith would be the majority of faith in China? Now, of course, What's happening now, Xi Jinping and the centralized government and the persecution and things like the social credit system, things are as bad for the Christians as they were back under Mao Zedong. So it's a very tough situation. And in that, do you see the church uh, still flourishing or struggling? Well, it's still flourishing with tremendous courage. Yeah. Um, but it remains to be seen how successful she will be. This series is looking at the church getting to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Geographically, the church is now at the ends of the earth. So what is the word, what does the phrase to the ends of the earth mean to you now? Part of the call of Abraham was that promise that he would be a blessing to the earth. And we're now seeing in the global era. In other words, in the global era, Human interconnectedness has reached truly global levels. So it's possible for anyone. You know, when my grandfather went to China, it would take six weeks or so to get there. You know, I remember as a boy going by ship, it would take the best part of three weeks to get there. And then later on, you just fly. 
Um, so the ends of the earth now, any of us can reach them if we have the money in 24 hours. So this is terrific. But the challenge is once we reach them, are we really bringing the whole gospel in a way that is salty and light bearing, that is changing the cultures we reach? And that's the challenge because we're not making the impact in the West that we should be. At the moment, modernity has proved stronger than the Western church. And that's an insult to the gospel.